we're in week four of our series through the book of Ephesians. And, uh, you know, this is an incredible book in the Bible. I, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that a lot of commentators have a, a spiritual crush on the book of Ephesians. They just love this book uh, so much. One, one commentator said it's the crown of the epistles, of all of Paul's writings to the early churches. One commentator was like, this is the greatest of all of them. And I don't know if you're allowed to have favorites, but some people do. I have some favorite books of the Bible. Ephesians is one of them. Um, and then, I, again, I said a couple weeks ago, one of these guys also said that Ephesians is the distilled essence of the Christian religion. And it's like, what's that mean? It's like, I'm not real sure, but it's very profound, right? The distilled essence of the Christian religion. I think what he means by that, though, really, is Ephesians is a book, the first three chapters are about what we need to, what the gospel does to us internally. The latter three chapters are about what happens through the gospel, through us externally. How do we understand the gospel, and then how do we live the gospel? So it's an amazing book, and uh, we're actually making our way into chapter 2 today. So we're making a little bit of ground. And I'm going to read to you from chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them. If not, we have a giant Bible on the screen behind me. So I'd love for you guys to follow along. Ten verses to go here. So if you can't, stay with me. Uh, but this is an amazing passage of Scripture today. Uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, As for you. He's not talking to somebody specifically. He's talking to all of us. We come to find that this is humanity. As for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And he says, for it is by grace, he says again, everybody one time say grace. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you're taking notes this morning, or if you like sermon titles, the title of this message is simply, What's So Good About the Good News? What's so good? You hear that all the time, the good news. What's so good about the good news? Let's go ahead and pray, then we'll jump into the word today. Father, we just ask today that by your spirit, you would speak clearly, and God, would you speak profoundly to each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that my sermon, my words would fall to the ground, but that your words would remain. Pierce our hearts, Holy Spirit, transform us, change us, and we just give you permission right now to form us into the image of Christ. We love you, Lord. We honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen, amen. amen. So um, I got engaged to my now wife um, when I was 22 years old. Okay, I know that's young, especially out here in D.C. People are like, why, you, why would you do that? We were 22 years old. And I think there might be a photo of us, uh, young bucks. I don't know if that's there. That's the night that I proposed to my wife. That's uh, 22 going on 23, Brandon and Delaney. And uh, I felt like I did a good job with the proposal. I'm not going to tell you this story, but ask my wife. I, I, was, pr I was proud of myself. I was impressed with me, you know. So that <laughs> sounds so stupid. But um, we got engaged at 22 years old. And you can see this nice, well, not really. That was a picture taken like 10 years ago, so it's not that clear. But there's a nice diamond ring. And I remember when I went in to buy my wife's, my wife's ring. And as a 22-year-old, I had no idea what I was doing. All I had was a crush on this girl and every dollar I had ever saved. And so I walk into this diamond shop. It was called Sheldon Jewelers. And I walk in there, and I think I just, like, I looked like an easy target the second I walked in there. This guy, like, in his 50s, I, I kid you not, I took one step in, and, like, he just was there to greet me. He's like, hey, what, you know, he gave me his name brought me in, and he said, tell me a little bit about what you're doing here. I said, well, I want to get engaged to this, this girl. She's the love of my life, and I'm ready to put a ring on it. Let's go. And so he starts asking me all these questions, and it was funny because he didn't even start off by, by trying to sell me a diamond. He wanted to know about Delaney. He said, tell me about her. Tell me about how you guys met. What does she love? What does she like? And what I didn't realize is he was trying to get me real infatuated with her in that moment, so I'd be ready to drop some serious coin on this ring. 
as I'm thinking about it, he's like, is she worth it? Is she worth this? I'm like, of course she is, you know? And, uh, but it was a funny experience as a whole. And if you haven't done this before, especially if you go in young and you have no idea what's happening, but so we go in there and he immediately starts teaching me about diamonds. He says, Brandon, there's four C's of diamonds. We've got cut, we've got clarity, color, and we've got carrots. Cut, clarity, color, carrot. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about right now. And so he starts giving me this spiel. He's asking me what, you know, my wife, would, would, would she like a, a circle cut, a princess cut? I'm like, well, she does like princesses. So we might go with that, you know. And, and so we're, we're, we're going through this whole conversation. And he keeps going back and going to these cases, and he would grab rings from me, or he would go to the back and be like, oh, I've got one for you. And he'd grab it. And every time he would bring me a ring, he did something kind of interesting. He wouldn't just hand me the diamond ring, and he wouldn't just set it on the glass countertop. This guy was a little bit old-fashioned, I think. He would reach into his jacket pocket, and he would pull out this black velvet cloth, and he'd wave it out in the air, lay it on the table, and then he would set that diamond ring right on top of it. And then he would just back away. And then there I am left just staring at this ring. And they have these really, you know, shining, like, bright lights coming down. And just so it reflects and you're hit with the glory of God as you look at this ring, you know. <laughs> and he set it on this black cloth. And every time he put it away, he'd put that velvet cloth away. He'd bring another ring out. He'd pull the velvet cloth out, set it down, set the ring on it. And it was funny because in, in this moment, I remember the incredible contrast of the black velvet cloth with the gleam of the diamond. Like this thing would just make that diamond pop. I think this guy knew what he was doing. He knew that the dark cloth highlighted the beauty, the clarity, and the vibrancy of the diamond to cause me to be more impressed with something so I'd be willing to buy something probably of greater value. I bring this up this morning because here in our passage today, Paul, I think, is desperate to show us the beauty, the clarity, and the vibrancy of Christ and his gospel. He wants to show us how brightly Christ and his grace shines. But he does this not without first pulling out the dark velvet cloth of our sin. I think Paul wants you to understand that you will never appreciate the gospel as long as you don't have a healthy rear view mirror perspective of the sin that he has saved you from and is saving you from right now. He says, I want you to know, I don't want you to dwell in that past, but I want you to be aware of it so you can have a gratitude for where he's brought you. A lot of the time, we're not grateful for grace. It's like, well, my past is gone and it's forgiven, and it is. But we ought to know where we've come from so we can see how far Jesus has brought us. So he pulls out this cloth to show us the beauty of Christ. But before Paul gets to the beauty of the gospel, he rolls out the ugliness of our sin. And we are shown the great contrast of our sin in light of God's grace. You know, I think this morning we're going to come to find that the good news is so good. Partially because the bad news is so bad. You ever got news that was like, it wasn't that good, but it seemed like it was really good because like the bad news was so bad? Well, this is really bad news, but this is also better news than we could ever imagine. It's the best news. It's the gospel. I don't know if you've ever had somebody come to you and they said, hey, I've got good news and I've got bad news. What's the next question they ask? Which one do you want first, right? Now, I think that this might be the common thing that when they ask you that, I always want the bad news first. I'm like, lay it on me heavy. If this news knocks me down, I'm going to need some good news to pick me back up on my feet, right? I need the bad news first. And this is kind of what Paul does in this passage here in Ephesians. This is what we're going to unpack today. But the news gets good. I can promise you that. So we go back to verse 1. And Paul's writing and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And so we're going to come back to this word dead because you can't just skip over a word like that. And so we'll come back to that. But I want to first look at these, these two key words, transgressions and sins. So in the Greek, I want to look at this first word, transgression. Transgression is the Greek word paraptoma, paraptoma. And what it is, it's, it's a false step or it's a crossing of a known boundary or a deviation from the right path. So this is symbolic of those moments in the life of our faith where we don't accidentally cross a line, but this would be called the sin of commission, right? We intentionally cross a line or a barrier that we know goes outside of the will and the plan of God. That's a transgression. Now the word sin. I want to key in on this word for a few moments because I think in our English understanding of, of sin, I think so, so often the scope that we have is far too narrow. We think sin is just the lying, the, the cheating. I had a lustful thought. I got a little too angry at somebody. I got some road rage out there on these D.C. streets. Like, um, we, we, we tie sin to those things. But I think understanding this word, we're going to begin to see that sin goes far beyond just that. The word sin is fascinating. And the word sin is this. In Greek, it's the word hamartia. Everybody say hamartia. We're speaking Greek today. I love it. Hamartia. 
and it means to miss the mark or to error, to fall short of a standard. Now, hamartia is interesting because it doesn't just appear 2,000 years ago as Paul is writing to the early church. This was a word and a concept that was around for 500 years before Paul shows up on the scene. Hamartia actually has its roots in ancient Greek literature. So I'm going to read something to you that won't come up on the screen, so track with me for a second. Here's what I read this week about hamartia. It says, hamartia was a literary device that refers to the tragic flaw of a main character in a story which ultimately leads to the character's downfall. Errors of judgment or specific character traits like excessive pride, lust, greed, or jealousy can be a character's fatal flaw. Hamartia represents a reversal in the protagonist's fortune from good to bad. So I think this is really kind of fascinating. Paul, he's writing about sin in the New Testament, and he kind of co-ops this this word from Greek literature. He takes it to to help us to realize that sin is not merely just missteps and mistakes, but sin became the fatal flaw for all of humanity. It it was bigger than just merely I crossed a line or, or I missed the mark. He goes back and he writes about Adam. Paul writes about Adam and he says, Adam missed the mark in the garden. The other thing that's really interesting about this word is it became uh, used regularly in archery. So people would be doing archery competitions and there would be a judge, a line judge that would be down the field And if one of the archers missed the target, the judge would call out Hamartia, basically to alert the other judges and the archer that they missed the target completely. And so when you start to think about this, Adam is going all the way back to, or Paul is going all the way back to Adam in the garden. And he's saying just through this one man in the very beginning who missed the mark. Now, what was the mark he missed? The mark was the holiness and the standard of God. So Adam misses this mark, but it doesn't just affect him. It's not just his transgression. It becomes the transgression of humanity. Every one of us are tied into this. He says no one is exempt from the effects and the impact of sin. Paul says that all have sinned or hamartia and fallen short of the glory of God and fallen short of his standard. Paul also says the wages of sin is death. So you start to think about this. And so not only does sin make us deserving of death, It also resulted in our spiritual death. This is what Paul then says if we go back to verse 1. He says, as for you, you were dead in these transgressions and sins. So I want you to please understand this this morning, guys. Sin does not make you bad. Sin makes you dead. And I think in Christianity right now, we have a little bit of a problem in the way that we understand the gospel and often the way that we talk about and we preach the gospel. We sometimes let on that that encountering and accepting Jesus and understanding grace and salvation just happens to make you a little bit better when we don't understand really that salvation is not about making you good. It's about bringing you back to life. It was never about just making people that were already maybe a little bit morally good, just a little bit better. No, it was about bringing people who were spiritually dead and disconnected to God back to life and bringing reconciliation to the Father. So we're spiritually dead. One of the commentators I read this week, he tied this idea to what he called the walking dead. He said, this is kind of an image of it, the walking dead. And I don't know if you ever watched the show. Um, I got really into the show, The Walking Dead, for a long time. And then I got really disappointed because it became less about zombies and more about humans just fighting other humans. And I was like, I get enough of that on Twitter already. Like, I don't need this kind of negativity in my life. So I haven't watched the show. I haven't watched the show in a while. But in the show, The Walking Dead, it's about zombies. Let's be real. And these, are, these zombies are bodies that are moving around, but they're not actually alive. And so what Paul is saying that in some sense, our spiritual state before we encounter salvation, he said our bodies are moving but internally there's no life. We do not respond to spiritual stimuli before we are in Christ because our spirit is dead. So he says we're like the walking dead in some sense. We're we're not simply bad because of sin. We are dead in sin. And if I was preaching right now, like if I was like really preaching right now, I was just going for it, I'd probably say something like "The, the unbeliever doesn't need resuscitation. The unbeliever needs resurrection. Can I get a good amen somebody, right? And then I'll probably tell you to tap 17 people around you and say, you need a resurrection. Come on, somebody. But we don't need resuscitation. We need resurrection. And I want you to understand that this morning. If we are going to see the vibrancy and the clarity of Christ, you have to understand that your sin didn't just make you a little bit bad, but you were dead in your sin. 
Encountering Christ meant encountering resurrection. He brought our spirit back to life. Paul then goes on in this passage to explain what this looked like for us and and what it still looks like for those who are not in Christ. And here's what he does. He says this, that when we were dead in sin, and then he unpacks three things that were true of us. Number one is this, when we were dead in sin, number one, it says we followed the ways of the world. So he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Now, this is kind of funny. You can kind of tell by just looking at Christianity over the past century that we haven't really been able to understand and collectively wrap our heads and our minds around what it means to be of the world. So over the last century or so, I think about my grandparents' generation, what it meant to be worldly or to be of the world. For my grandparents' generation, like, if you went out dancing, straight to hell. Like, dancing was what the devil did. Devil invented dancing, and if you dance, you're part of his whole thing that's going on here. That was serious. They grew up like that. Then you got my mom and dad's generation. Just one generation later, for them, if you went to a movie theater, or what my grandmother called the picture house, you know, if you went to a movie theater, and Jesus came back while you were in that theater, he's not coming there to get you. You're going to get left behind. And I know that may be shocking to some of you. You're like, what are you talking about? No, there is a massive percentage of our population that grew up like this. And so people were not excited about the second coming of Jesus. They were terrified. Like if I'm having an impure thought when Jesus returns, or God forbid I'm in a movie theater, then I'm getting left behind and I'm not going to go to heaven with Jesus. And so you look throughout just history, the last hundred years, and what it means to be of the world is this weird moving target. And now the pendulum has swung so far the other direction that what it means to be of the world today, there's no real definition of it. There are a lot of Christians that look exactly like the world. There's no distinction and there's no separation. So what does it mean to be worldly? What does it mean to be of the world? Well, the word translated world in this passage is the word cosmos. And the meaning here is not the physical universe that we see an experience. Rather, it refers to a world that rejects God. That's what cosmos is. Or we can define cosmos as this, human society organizing itself without God. Today, this is what we would refer to as secularism. So the world is secularism. And secularism, I think, can be defined as society built devoid of and sometimes in defiance of God. Defiance toward him. Mark Sayers Um, an amazing pastor and preacher, and he's kind of a social commentator. And he does such an amazing job at looking at our current cultural moment and helping believers wrap their minds around how do we engage this time and space that we live in right now. What Mark Sayers says about this as he defines secularism and his intent is he says the, the whole of contemporary Western culture, from the structure of our malls and cities to the very fabric of the internet and social media platforms, our ideologies that shape us toward a vision, look at this, not rooted in the eternal, but in the unlimited freedom and pleasure of the individual in the moment. So secularism may have this grand vision for the future. Like our world outside of, outside of Christ and outside of church has a vision and an idea of where it wants to go and where it's headed. So it has a grand view of the future, but secularism is completely lacking any vision for the eternal. There's nothing eternal about it. Yeah, this is where we're going, but what about once you get there, what next? And what I love about what God does is he says, I'm not just going to give the church a vision for the future, but I'm going to give you a vision for eternity. And so according to Mark Sayers, secularism is everything and it's everywhere. It's pervasive. And according to scripture, and honestly probably our own personal experience, there is a constant unrelenting pressure to keep those who are already in and to conform those who aren't. And this is why Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, he says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be, if you know it, say it with me, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform, be transformed. Do not conform, be transformed by the renewing. And I love this. It's not just a renewed like you do at one time. No, it is a renewing. It is continual and it is progressive and probably needs to be done every single day. 
Understand the culture you're in. Understand the workplace and the environment you're in. And understand what you're going to be inundated with every single day. And if you're not hitting reset every night or reset every morning and saying, God, I don't want this stuff to be what gets in me and becomes who I am. But I want your word to get in me and for that to become who I am at the deepest level of who I am. He says, look, do not conform. And Paul gives us this reminder because it's easier to conform than we realize. I was thinking about a way to illustrate this, and I thought of, you know, when I first moved to D.C., I was utterly appalled at the way people drive in this city. I mean, I showed up, and I was like, what is happening here? There is no regard for human life. It is every man and woman for themselves out there. So I show up, and I'm offended. I'm asking questions. I'm like, is this so loud? Like, we're just going to drive like this. This is what we do. It's so aggressive, and at night, it just becomes lawless. I'm like, people driving on the wrong side of the road. I'm like, the bicyclists just like, are we paying attention at all? Like, at all, we're just blazing through red lights, you know? And anyway, I'm, I'm stressing out over here. So I'm out there, and I'm, when I start, when I moved here a year and a half ago, I'm a very defensive driver. I'm being really cautious. I was really kind. I'm letting people merge. Like, what a novel idea. I'm like, you know what? You go. You go in front of me. I'm going to act like Jesus out here. Yeah, you. I'm going to let another car go as well. Here you go. I'm, I'm defensive. Dry. I'm just being kind out there. I'm using my turn signals. It's just crazy. I'm waiting patiently when the light turns green and somebody doesn't go for about two, you know, 0.25 seconds. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give you a second. You might be glancing at your phone. You might be trying to pinch your kid in the back seat. You might be taking in a monument. I don't know. And it just hit me the other day that um, perhaps I've changed a bit. And I'll tell you what happened. And it wasn't even out on the streets. I'm in my front yard with my kids. And we had this little brick path from our gates off New Jersey Avenue to my house. And we got this gate. And my kids, they're playing traffic. That's how you know you're raising kids in the city. They just play traffic. I was like, who made this up? So then we have all their scooters and their bikes. And they're all lined up. And my daughter, Finley, my five-year-old, my three-year-old. And then they got my one-year-old just out there. He's just sitting on his little bike. They're like, just don't move, bro. Okay. They put me in there, and we're, it's gridlock. We're not going anywhere in this, in this traffic right now. And all of a sudden, my three-year-old son, Carson, behind me, we're just kind of like playing traffic. He starts honking his fake horn, and he goes, come on, bro, the light is green. <laughs> and I look back, and I was like, there's only one place he could have got that from, <laughs> this guy right here. And I, and I tell you this, to, you know, in my shame, because I realized in that moment, that I, be, I have become the very thing I was once appalled by. And the reason I bring this up is because the same thing can happen to us spiritually so often. What was initially shocking, when we come to Christ and then we, we get this new lens and we look at the world, what was, it, what was initially shocking and uncomfortable and maybe even appalling can easily become the very thing we become. That's why Paul said, hey, don't conform to the pattern because it's easy to do. And it's easy to do without even thinking about it. Eugene Peterson, in, the, in his message, it's not a translation, but it's paraphrase. He says, don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you blend in and fit in without even realizing it. That's what begins to happen. You look up someday and you begin to realize, I look more like my workplace and my friends and the people that I'm going out with on weekends than I look like Jesus. It doesn't matter that we, it doesn't mean we don't go to our workplace. It doesn't mean we don't go out with our friends. It doesn't mean that we hide in, in, in secrecy and be like, this is the only place that I can grow in my faith. No. But it means that we have to be the ones that go out and say, I want to be the light and I want to be the influence and not be influenced by you. This is where we get it wrong. And so this happens in the life of faith so often. You know, one of the other things that we're taught about, we see about secularism is that really it undermines belief and it promotes doubt. And this is going to move us into the second thing today. Paul reveals here what, or better, I would say, who is the driving force behind secularism. So the second thing is that when we're dead in sin, number two, is we follow the works of the enemy. We follow the works of the enemy. So we'll continue on. He says that you were dead in your transgressions and sins you used, uh, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, this is really interesting how it's worded, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. This is actually one of the many names for Satan throughout Scripture. He's got a lot of names. He's got Satan. We've got the devil. We've got uh, the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren. One of the most common names for him is the deceiver or the liar. Jesus actually tells us in the Gospels, he said that the enemy has no truth in him. 
And we read elsewhere in scripture that when the enemy speaks and when he speaks lies, he's actually speaking his native tongue. So when he tells the truth, that's like his, that's like his third language. But when he's lying, he's saying that's his native language. So as you begin to look at the enemy and this main idea and concept of deception and lying, you, you begin to find the enemy's primary goal is that of deception and doubt. And this comes about in trying to keep the non-believer deceived and to stir up doubt in the heart and the mind of the believer. And so when we are following the works of the enemy, it means that we are walking in deception. I think sometimes we think the enemy's main goal is to like, ra- like round people up and make them particularly evil and sinister and immoral and just make people do just the worst, most heinous things you could ever imagine. Now, while certainly we tie the great evils of this world to him and his influence, I often think his best work is done in much more subtle ways. You know, I think the work of the enemy is far less sensational than we would like to believe. Because we want to see it, right? When it's sensational, you go, that looks like the devil, but what about when it's subtle? It's a lot harder to recognize and to understand. Please understand this this morning. Satan does not need people to destroy the world. He wants people to deny Jesus. So what is it going to take for him to get you to that point or to keep the world in their denial of who Jesus is? And he says says this as he closes this statement. He says, it's the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, I learned something this week that's really fascinating about this word. The word disobedient is essentially in Greek the same word for disbelief. They can kind of be used interchangeably based on the context. So disobedience and disbelief are the same word. I love this from uh, Daryl Johnson, who wrote uh, in his commentary on Ephesians. He said, what Paul's doing here. He said, Paul is telling us that the root of disobedience is disbelief. The root of non-obeying is non-believing. That is the goal of the prince of the power of the air, non-believing. Everything he does in the air, in the atmosphere in which we humans live, is unto the one great end of disbelief. You see, disbelief is the root of disobedience. And then Paul goes on to the third thing. He says, we we were dead in sin. We followed the ways of the world, the works of the enemy. And number three, we followed the wants of the flesh. In Ephesians 2 verse 3, he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires. The flesh is a a phrase, a term that you kind of see all over the New Testament, particularly in Paul's writings. And what this is, the, what the idea of the flesh is, is it's regarding both the unbeliever and the believer. So we're, we're similar in our uh, understanding of what the flesh is. It refers to our depraved nature. So this whole flesh and spirit thing often creates a really frustrating dynamic in the life of a believer. I'm going to expound on this a little bit. So your, your spirit is saved, but you still live in this physical world, in this physical body. And that creates a lot of tension in the life of the believer. And so um, you, you'll be able to relate to Paul here. I love Paul. He gets unbelievably vulnerable in Romans chapter 7. It's one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible because it's so relatable. So Paul's talking about the flesh and he's talking about sin and how he's wanting to try to please God with his life. But look what he says. He says this. And well, come on, I'm just going to tell you this. He says, I don't understand what I do. Now just that in and of itself, how relatable is that? How many times have you been like doing something like, I don't, under- I don't understand me at all. Like, not even a little bit. He's like, I don't even get me. And then he goes on to say, I do what I, what I don't want to do, and then I don't do what I, what I want to do. Then he says, my desire is to do good, but I can't seem to carry it out. Have you been there before? And we come to find that our entire spiritual life feels kind of like a diet. Like, I want to be skinny, but I also want cake. Come on, you know? And this is what the spiritual life feels like. I want to be holy. I want to please God. But my flesh also still wants the things that Jesus saved me out of. It wants to go back. And I I want you to understand this because if you're not aware of this tension and that it's normal and something that you will face every day of your life, my fear is that you will become discouraged thinking, well, I'm saved. Shouldn't I no longer struggle with these things anymore? And it's just not true. Let me tell you this, though. I do believe that maturity in your faith is not that you become perfect. That's not possible. Not that you become perfect. But I do believe maturity is that your flesh begins to lose these battles more than your spirit does. 
So we're not striving for perfection, but you're going to begin to realize that you're growing in your faith when your spirit begins to win more than your flesh wins. But if you're, if you're getting beat up right now, you're like, I love Jesus and I really believe I've been saved, but I, get, I keep getting caught in sin. That doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're still in your flesh. So what you got to do is continue to encourage and build up your spirit man or your spirit woman and begin to say, God, I obviously can't do this on my own. Holy Spirit, I need you. Empower me to win this battle over my flesh. But for those who are not in Christ, what Paul is saying is that it's not a battle. The spirit in them is dead, and there's nothing to wage war against the flesh with. So when we were in this state, we didn't battle sin. We were in complete bondage to sin. And sometimes I have people come to me and they ask me, Brandon, how do I know that I'm saved, man? I just, I'm concerned. And I just, I've been struggling. And I always look at people and I say, the fact that we're having this conversation means that the Holy Spirit is stirring something in your heart. Because if we weren't having this conversation, you know what that would mean? That you're dead in your sin. And you wouldn't be in this battle right now. Even though you're getting your butt kicked, at least you're in the battle. And I believe that God is good enough to pick you back up on your feet. But you got to understand where your help comes from. Not you, but God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So then Paul ends verse 3, and he takes us even deeper into this black cloth pit of despair. And he says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So this is where we're left. Dead, disobedient, depraved, and quite frankly, doomed. This is the picture that Paul is painting. I told you it's some bad news. And in in film, this is kind of the moment that is referred to as the all is lost moment. You ever watching a movie and you're like, is this ever going to get good? Right, the buildup of all the negativity and the, the difficulty is so bad. But this is kind of that all is lost moment that directors like to build into a story to get us on the edge of our seat, looking, feeling hopeless, only to bring the climactic turning point that changes everything. So I began to think about this a little bit. This is that moment in movies and TV series that is what makes them so good and memorable. So, for example, for all my Gen Z and millennial, or my Gen Xers and millennials in the house, okay? I'm a a millennial, praise God. Let's go. My Gen Xers and millennials, this is that moment where Gandalf returns to Helm's Deep, right, on the fifth day at dawn. He's at the top of that mountain with the riders of Rohan, and they begin to charge down the mountain to vanquish the Urukai army of Saruman. You didn't know I was that level of nerd, did you? Let's go. For my, for my Gen Zers in the room, this is, this is when Thanos is about to win. But then all of a sudden in Endgame, the, the Avengers who have been gone for five years begin to reappear. Here comes Falcon. He's like on your left and you got chills and you're like, oh my gosh, you're having a spiritual moment right there. This is, okay, for no, okay that doesn't hit you at all. Uh, my Friends fans in the room, those of you that like Friends, this is when Ross is in the apartment. And he's trying to listen to Rachel's voicemail to figure out what happened. All of a sudden to hear a voice behind him that says, I got off the plane. Right, I got off the plane. Is there no Friends fans? Okay, I'm going to skip that one next time. That was for my wife. That was for my wife. She got saved. Let's go. Okay, so she got off the plane. But this is, this is those moments, right? All is lost, the hopeless moment. But we have that climactic turn of events. And this is what Paul is doing here. This is the turning point in his writing. Many commentators suggest that what we're about to read is one of the clearest presentations of the gospel that we have in the entirety of scripture. So let's go back to verses 4 through 10. It says this in verse 4. It says, but, everybody say but. But because of his great love for us, God, and look at, just look at these words and phrases. Who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, and it is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He said, it is by grace you have been saved. Can I ask the question, what does it mean to be saved? You've probably said that before. Yeah, I got saved, you know. I've experienced salvation. But if I were to bring you up here on the mic, open mic real quick, and I say, hey, what does it mean to be saved? I think there would be a lot of people that wouldn't know how to articulate that. It's like, well, like I, I believe in Jesus. Like, I don't know. Do you know what salvation means? To, me, to be saved means a few things. 
It means we are forgiven of all of our sins. It means we are cleansed of our unrighteousness. It means we are justified before the judge of the universe. You know, can I just pause for a second? One of the craziest and most asinine things people could ever say when they're being judged by someone else is, you know what, only God can judge me. And I'm like, no, exa that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want God to judge you. No, 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 he is the judge of the universe. This is why Jesus came, so that we could accept him and be justified before the judge. Only God, God can judge you? Like, no, 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 that's not what you want. It's way better if people judge you, I promise you. Embrace that over the judgment of God. But we stand justi justified before the judge. We're reconciled to the creator. We are adopted into the family of God, and we are given the promise of eternity with him. That's what it means to be saved. And this saving, Paul writes over and over and over again. It is done by grace. Grace is defined as the unmerited favor of God. So when God gives you his grace, he's giving you his unearned, unmerited favor. You did nothing to get it. He just said, I want to lavish this upon you. If you embrace Christ as your Savior, we have the unmerited grace of God. I love Pastor Matt Chandler. He says this all the time. He says, grace means you didn't eat your dinner, but you still get dessert. Come on, that's good, right? I think about it with my kids all the time. Like I'm, I'm always like doing this for my kids. They don't eat their dinner, and I'm like threatening. I'm like, you're not going to get dessert. And then I still give them dessert anyway. And my wife, she calls it enabling. I call it the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, don't stop me from showing my kids the love of their heavenly father, you know? It doesn't get that spiritual. And honestly, I probably am a bit of an enabler. But he is rich, it says. We'll go on. He's rich in mercy and grace. So the picture that Paul paints so beautifully is that because of our sin, we stand guilty before God. We are children of wrath, deserving of justice, of receiving our due penalty. But in his mercy and grace, something different happens. One way we can define this is that in his mercy, he withholds from us what we do deserve. And in his grace, he gives us what we do not deserve. So mercy withholds the justice of God and grace gives his salvation. And we receive this grace. How? Through faith. You cannot earn grace. You don't go get it. You open up your hands in faith and you receive it. That's the only thing you have to do is to look to Jesus and say, I acknowledge you as Lord and God and as Savior. Now I open my hands and I receive you and I receive the grace of God. Richard Lovelace, in a book called Dynamics of Spiritual Life, I love what he adds to this conversation. He says, many professing Christians are drawing their assurance of acceptance with God from their sincerity, their past experience of conversion, their recent religious performance, or the relative infrequency of their conscious willful disobedience. Few know enough to start each day with a thoroughgoing stand upon Luther's platform. He's referencing Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, who said this, you are accepted looking outward in faith and, and claiming the holy, the completely alien righteousness of Christ as the only ground for acceptance. That's all it is. We don't look to God and say, God, look how righteous and great I've been. No, we look out to Jesus and say, the only thing that will make me righteous, Jesus, is your righteousness. And I receive that. The holy and completely righteousness of Christ. You know, the prophet Isaiah, he even went as far as to tell us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. So even what we can do and accomplish, he said, it's, it's still dirty before a holy God. The apostle Paul, in reflecting about his life, he said, I now consider my accomplishments and my achievements done in religion, done in, in my zealousness. I consider my personal righteousness and good works, he says, as rubbish. The actual better translation of that is not rubbish, it's dung. He says, I, the King James Version gets this one right. He says, I consider all of it just nonsense and trash. See, grace is the gift of God. He says, just receive it. Our righteousness cannot compare to the righteousness of God. So I want to ask this question as I begin to close. This grace that we're talking about, where does this grace take us? And I think the easiest, simplest answer is, well, this grace is, it's taken us to heaven. Right? Because I have grace, I have the promise of eternity, and that's where we're going, man. And, and you would be right. Grace does take you to heaven. Grace is the thing that will carry you into eternity. But I think there's something more for right here and right now. And this is where I want to go to verse 10. That almost seems out of place in this whole conversation. But you know that Paul, writing inspired by the Holy Spirit, there's something real here. 
And he says this in verse 10. It says, for, which connects it to everything he just said, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What I love about what he does here at the very end of this thought is Paul writes so much about grace and salvation and that it's not by our own works. It's not by what we can do. And then he ends it by talking about how now we got to go and do good works. And what we begin to find is that grace humbles us, kind of gets us to a, a lowly point, but then it picks us back up and it puts us to work. This is the part that we so often forget. Now, let me be clear before you think I'm like on the verge of heresy here. We are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Now, if you don't believe me, let me back this up, okay? Maybe you'll believe Jesus. I don't know, okay? Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And then in verse 16, he says, now let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and glorify not you, but your Father in heaven. And he's saying, so you were saved, not by works, but now that you've been saved, you've been empowered to do good works, and your good works might result in the salvation of other people. They're going to glorify God. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says that we should abound in every good work. In Colossians, he says, be fruitful in every good work. In 2 Timothy, he says the believer is thoroughly equipped for every good work. I think sometimes we just forget this and we think, man, I received grace and now I just rest in that. I don't got to do anything. That's actually not what scripture teaches. I heard a pastor say this one time. He said, salvation is not a vacation. It's a vocation. I thought that's incredible. Right, we're going to go to paradise someday, but we're not there yet. So it's still time to work. It's still time to be a part of God's plan of redemption. It's, it's not a vacation, it's a vocation. And so in an effort to not be a heretic, right, people, I think they tiptoe around this concept of works and they get a little bit confused. So let me say it like this. Grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. You cannot earn grace it is the gift of God. But once you receive it, grace empowers you to live according to the call and the purpose that God has for your life. It's the empowerment and the enablement we have. And so we are invited to partner with God in his plan of redeeming and renewing the world. And so, guys, we don't just sit back and wait for heaven and say, thank you, God, that I'm saved, and just sit back. But we walk now in a way that brings a little bit of heaven to earth every single day. What if you woke up each day and begin to ask yourself the question, how can I bring heaven to earth today? What if tomorrow morning you woke up and thought the first, the first thing you thought was, how can I bring heaven to earth today in my marriage, in my family, to my workplace, to my friend groups, to social media? How do I bring heaven to these spaces? Because this is what we are called to do. We're not called to be a passive church that just sits and rests in the grace of God alone, but our salvation sits and rests in that grace. But then God empowers us and he says, now get up church and go out into this world. And I want people to see the work that you do for my purposes and my kingdom so they can bring glory to the name of Jesus. And so the father can be known so people can be reconciled to him. We've got a job to do. And God says, I, give, I have given you these things and I prepared them for you before you were ever even born. So my prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit just stirs in you a bit, that he's revealed to you a little bit about the beauty, the clarity, and the vibrancy of the gospel. See, remember this, we were created by God. We became dead in our sin. We were recreated in Christ, made alive by grace, and now empowered by grace to walk in purpose. And none of this is from ourselves, it is the gift of God. This is what Paul teaches. I'm going to invite my wife to join me up here. If you guys would, would you grab your communion cups that should be uh, on or around your seats when you came in? And on that note this morning, I, we want to take a moment to take communion together. So actually, would you guys stand to your feet? I'd like for you to stand. You know, in scripture, when Jesus is at the Last Supper, he's with his disciples. And in the moment that he's doing these things, they're very confusing, right? He's talking to them. Then out of nowhere, he starts breaking bread. And he says, this is my body that is broken for you. He says, take and, and eat. Do this often. Then he takes the, the wine. He begins to pour it out. He says, this wine is my, the new covenant. It's my blood. He says, I want you to pour this out. Drink it. 
do this often in remembrance of me. And I don't think what they knew in that moment, what they realized is that this was the beginning of Jesus bringing in the new covenant, not of law, but of grace. Where he said, hey, everything that you were trying and striving to do but couldn't, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna take it all upon myself. Those wages of sin that equates to death, I'm not gonna make you die that death, I'm gonna take it on myself. And the new covenant of grace enters in now. And Jesus asked the disciples, he said, I want you to do this often in remembrance of me. Remember the sacrifice that I made. Remember the very reason that you've encountered grace. Remember the very reason that you can have salvation and the hope and the promise of eternity with the Father again. And so Delaney's up here and I'm gonna let her jump in and kind of lead us in taking this communion together. But as we think back today and we reflect with that rear view mirror perspective of our sin to know where we've come from, why don't we also look even past our sin and reflect on what Jesus has done to cover all of those things from our past. And that's what communion is. Yes. So if you would take your cups and let's open up the top part and together we're gonna take the bread. And this is to symbolize the body of Christ, which was broken for us, for our sins and our transgressions, broken so that we might experience wholeness. Let's take the bread together. And now we take the cup, which symbolizes the blood of Jesus, which was poured out to cover our sins and to make us new so that we can be in Christ, like we talked about today. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Jesus, right now in this moment of remembrance, we can't help but be humbled by your sacrifice and what it means for each of us. The fact that you in your deity would come to us in our humanity, broken, sinless, apart from you, and you would chase after us, that your arms would be extended wide on the cross, symbolically as a gesture to invite all in to you, Lord. We're grateful for your sacrifice, and we're grateful for what the hope of the gospel means for us, God, and for every heart that is in here today that may be distant from you, far from you, closed off to you, I pray, God that you will soften those hearts, that you will tear down those walls, and by the power of your spirit, you will draw them to you, Lord. We're so grateful for the free gift of salvation. Now, Holy Spirit, we pray that you empower every single one of us to live it out in our daily lives, to be an extension of you here on the earth, on earth as it is in heaven. We're grateful to be a part of your story. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.